All right, we're here. So, hey everybody, my name is uh, Chris Neidl. I am a uh, volunteer for Brooklyn Do or Die, which is a local uh, Brooklyn-based indivisible group, um, sort of based in the um, Clinton Hill bed area uh, in the uh, New York uh, 8th Congressional District. Um, I'm also uh, part of the, uh, the group's uh, Climate and Environment uh, Committee. And uh, a little while ago, I had this idea um, that I thought might be helpful both to members of our group and the sort of grassroots world more broadly is to reach out to folks, uh, leaders and experts uh, that are uh, involved in the climate movement um, to get their insights and information about select climate related subjects that might um, help inform our grassroots activism um, and give us some guidance. So uh, to that end, I'm really, really happy today that I am uh, able to talk with a, uh, an old friend of mine and a superhuman being, uh, May Ovi. Uh, who is uh, one of the founding members of 350.org, which is really the nation's uh, you know, leading uh, climate advocacy group. Uh, and she's currently the executive director of 350. So, May, how you doing? Thanks so much for joining. Doing well. Thanks for having me, Chris. And you all should know that Chris is one of the most extraordinary organizers that I know. So you're in good hands. Too, too kind. Uh, but thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, so there's a, there's a million um, things that we could talk about uh, related to this administration, this Congress, and climate change. Very little of it uh, good news. Uh, we could talk about the, uh, what's happening at the EPA, uh, um, what, what the sort of the future of U.S. participation in the Paris Agreement are. But what I wanted to do actually um, is look a little bit beyond that uh, to another um, front um, that's highly relevant to, to climate, and that's infrastructure, uh, and thought you could, you could give us some really useful information uh, and some guidance on that front. And the reason why I, I'm interested in that is it's obviously clearly a, a high priority of the Trump administration. It's directly related to uh, really one of the core things that got him into the White House, and that was the promise of, uh, of job creation. Um, and it also seems to be um, an area where he might have the greatest luck in actually getting some Democrats over to support, uh, depending on what, you know, what it's actually uh, shaped like. And to me, it seems like it's something that, you know, could potentially um, have a, a positive impact uh, on our climate goals or a very detrimental one. So what I wanted to do is, uh, is first get your uh, sort of thoughts about the relevance of infrastructure as sort of a battleground for the climate movement, and then talk a little bit about how the politics of that are shaping up, and then most importantly, help direct us maybe to um, some some areas or some strategies that we can take on um, to make sure that any infrastructure uh, plans that happen um, are pro climate. So, how's that sound? Sounds great. Great. So, just to just to get started, if you could just tell us again, help fr make us understand why. Uh, major infrastructure spending is a really significant, you know, battleground for, for the climate. So the first thing to understand about it is that when we think about climate change, in many ways we're thinking about energy and our global energy system here and around the world and the degree to which we're building an energy system that continues to rely on fossil fuels versus one that moves us into the next energy economy that is powered by wind and solar and 100% renewable energy. So infrastructure and the construction of major projects that relate to energy is deeply tied into climate change. And this is a feature of the climate movement from here to Turkey to India that activists are really focused on, how can my community move us into a climate safe world by relying on energy systems that don't pollute and that actually get us off of our dependence on fossil fuels. So this is the kind of basic thing to understand about it. And what we know scientifically is that in order to keep global warming at a reasonably safe level, because we know it's already with us, right? We're already seeing the impacts. We're already seeing massive hurricanes like Hurricane Sandy. We're seeing epic droughts and we're seeing even just this week, new news about Arctic ice melt that affects the entire sea level rise across the entire globe. So we know it's with us, but we're really trying to rein in the worst impact it could have. To do that, we have to keep about 80% of fossil fuels in the ground. So that means coal, oil, and gas. That means not actually burning anymore. So what do we do in a country where people need jobs and they need electricity? And I think that this is why the climate movement focuses on infrastructure. And people have been thinking about this even before the election, as a way of making the case that if we're sitting in a situation where people need to get back to work 
and we also know that we need to get ourselves off of fossil fuels, there's a possibility actually to create millions of jobs in retooling our energy economy to get us off of fossil fuels. And this isn't just putting solar panels on schools. This is changing the way the electrical grid works. This is investing in 100% electric public transportation systems. This is changing the way that water systems are used in different cities. So when Donald Trump says, I want to make America great again, I should get right off the bat and say, I don't believe him. <laughs> but we do actually want to make this country great. And we think the way to do that is to protect ourselves from the worst effects of climate change, to create communities with less pollution, and to actually build the kind of economic development that we know we could create through clean energy. Great. So let, let's now compare, you know, and get into some details of what you think would be the core elements of an infrastructure plan. It's kind of a once in a generation opportunity. That's one of the things that's sort of really important about this is that we're talking about a large effort uh, that you can't, you know, you can't get that sort of spending capacity, um, you know, every year. But what do you know at this point, you know, everything we've seen from the administration so far in regard to clean energy and climate has obviously been just, you know, just, just uniformly negative and horrible. Um, so we would assume that whatever infrastructure plans they have probably don't, you know, sort of centrally feature um, investments in clean infrastructure. What do we know so far about the priorities of that, how that, you know, what, what they're sort of looking to do in regards to energy as part of an overall larger infrastructure plan? Well, we know a few things about the Trump administration's stance on energy based on who's been appointed to fill major cabinet positions. And the relationship with the oil and gas industry in particular is very strong. The head of the EPA, Scott Pruitt, was attorney general for the state of Oklahoma. And actually, when he was attorney general, he had entire pieces of legislation drafted by the gas industry in Oklahoma. So that tie is very strong. And we also know that we have the former CEO of ExxonMobil sitting at the head of the State Department. And actually, just yesterday, uh, Exxon filed for a waiver of the sanctions with Russia so that Exxon could drill. So th this is who we know is in power, right? So this tells us a lot about infrastructure, actually. This, this d demonstrates to us that we can expect this package to include a lot of pipelines and a lot of plans to drill. And Unfortunately, this country has a lot of shale gas, this country has a lot of coal, um, and there have been some strides made in recent years, not nearly strong enough, to try to keep those reserves untapped. But they're very tempting, especially if you have members of the oil and gas industry in your cabinet providing you with a lot of advice. So we know that. Uh, second thing we know is that a lot of the way this is being looked at is what is it going to cost and who is going to pay? And there are different ways to approach infrastructure spending. Some of it is from the government itself and actually the belief in, and I'm not an economist, but that if you have the government invest in a lot of spending, you can boost the economy. It actually looks like a lot of this bill is going to be paid for by tax cuts. Um, and it will actually benefit a very small percentage of the population and that actually most of us will pay for it. It won't be paid for by the public sector and it won't release the kind of economic incentives that we might want to have. So those are some of the things that are coming up. But the other things that are, tend to be pretty standard are funding on roads and bridges and new highways and um, new you know, pipelines of many sorts, not just oil and gas. So that's probably what is coming together. The thing that we don't know for certain but that we're concerned about is that what do people really pay attention to in elections? Jobs right. in the economy. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm sitting in the White House and I want to be reelected, that's certainly where I'm going to put my focus. And if I'm a master of spin and deceit, I'm going to sell something that isn't based on any kind of fact. But I could certainly attend a lot of ribbon cutting ceremonies with people in hard hats in every state in the United States. Yeah. So we can expect this to be the vehicle through which Trump and Trumpism tries to get continued political power in this country. And we have to stop that. We have to find every way we can of getting in the way. And the single best thing we can do, and this is where I get to the hopeful part, is actually put forward our own vision and our own agenda for infrastructure. Tell, tell me about that, because that's, that's what I want to 
hang our hat on something that we could specific that we can elevate. So this is the good news that actually many of our movements and I would say the climate movement is one of the keys here. We have a lot of solutions. <laughs> we, we actually have a roadmap for getting every state in this country onto 100% renewable energy. There's been fantastic research done by uh, Mark Jacobson out of Stanford working with this great group called the Solutions Project, which has actually taken uh, the data from every state and helped create a roadmap off of coal, off of gas, off of oil, and onto solar, wind, and the other types of renewable energy technologies. So we know exactly what we can do. And yes, there's some work to be done figuring out the details, but that's true in any type of policy you might look at. But with, with this aspect in particular, the energy transition, this is some of the best information we have available. We've got groups working on this question of energy access, so not just the United States, but actually providing electricity for people who don't have it right now which is not to say everyone in the United States has electricity. I mean, on the Navajo Nation, where one of the country's largest coal plants sits, many people don't have access to electricity, which is incredibly ironic because they're sitting next to the coal fired power plant that helps power Los Angeles. But, mm -hmm. but they're within this whole field of providing electricity to people who need it, we've got the tools, we've got the engineers, and what we need are people in new jobs to actually be working city by city and state by state to retool the economy. There was a great article that was written a couple of years ago by my colleague, Bill McKibben, whom you know, all about the level of investment required to really combat climate change. And he compared it to the mobilization that was undertaken around World War II, that the amount of factories that needed to be built in this country just to build batteries for all of the solar panels is right. a massive investment. So. This is what we know we can do. And just last week, Senator Jeff Merkley and Senator Bernie Sanders introduced a bill which would cut, which would get us to 100% renewable energy by 2050 and calling for leaving fossil fuels in the ground. And these two does are- that have, Does that have a job component sort of explicitly built into it um, beyond just the goal of conversion? But does it sort of talk about a job creation piece as well? Absolutely. And their estimate is around 4 million new jobs as part of this package. And fortunately, um, every poll of Americans shows really high, like close to 90% support for solar. So, and that cuts across party lines. So they're talking about a very popular idea. And now we know this bill is not going to sail <laughs> through the current Congress, but we can't possibly defeat a bad idea without a better one. And that's what this is intending to do. So there's going to be a, a rally next week in Washington where they're going to unveil the bill on Tuesday, the 25th. And then at the climate march on the 29th of April, this is going to be a big part of why we're marching. It's not just to say we're scared about climate change. We certainly are. But more importantly to say, this is what we want. This is what we want to vote for. The politicians we want to support stand up for this message. And that's at every level of government, from mayor to governor to the president. Yeah, so this is great. One thing I'm, and I'll, I'll add links to all of the things you just discussed. I'll, I'll embed them in the video here so people can uh, click, click on them as they, as they watch. Um, but in terms of just the, the sort of the, the activism going forward, um, we have some time, obviously, before this really becomes, um, uh, you know, before the, the fight begins on this, which which is great because it allows us to maybe create expectations among our uh, legislators of what we do and don't want, helps sort of shape that, I guess. But my concern is, is, as we said at the top of the conversation, is that we not only have to move some Republicans, but we have to retain Democrats um, um, who also like photo ops with uh, cutting ribbons with people with hard hats as well. And, and you know, understandably, uh, you know, jobs are centrally important to them. So what do you recommend here that we do? And also, if you think about it in terms of what you know Indivisible has done, what Indivisible groups do, um, give us some priorities of what we can do to actually start uh, pushing these alternatives uh, to our leaders. Well, it, this is partly why it's useful to have legislation like this, because even if it's not necessarily a vehicle to get everyone to do a super competitive vote, we want co-sponsors. We want as many co-sponsors as we can possibly have. Mm -hmm. So going and asking, have you seen this and can you support it? This is the kind of clean energy solutions we want to see, I think is a very practical step. And I think there's likely to be 
uh, similar bills introduced at different state levels. And there's already a model bill in New York, for example, called, and the New York Renews Coalition has helped put this forward. And they're working with other states to create models. So even just expressing what is, what is being asked for in this bill and what could that look like in Indiana and in Minnesota and in Texas, you know? And right. so I think using this as a template for organizing is exactly what we have in mind. Because one of the uh, interesting things about an issue like climate change that's so connected to energy is there's actually a lot we can do at the local level. And admittedly, it does not pale in comparison to the scale at which we need to operate globally. But you can actually get your city to not do any fracking. I mean, you can actually get your state to ban pipelines. The state of Maryland just put forward an excellent uh, project to reduce their reliance on fracking just a few weeks ago. You know, mm -hmm. so you can both stop things at the state and city level and you can promote the better things. And so using this as a template to ask for that is exactly what we're hoping that activists will do in this moment. You know, let me ask you a question too about, you know, there, there, let me know if you agree with this. There seems to be some kind of a positive shift at least where more Republicans are willing to come out and say that they are for climate action. We had a couple of months ago a group of sort of former Reagan superstars, James Baker and Schultz, right. come out with this idea around a carbon tax. Um, but another group of 17 Republicans, uh, I think led by Stefanik uh, here in New York uh, State, that said they want to do something around climate action. Can we no longer assume that it's the case that it's going to be entirely a partisan issue, that there are a growing number of Republicans that could actually be brought over and something bipartisan could actually be proposed uh, that would, um, you know, that would advance our goals in regards to clean infrastructure? It seems, it seems like a harder road <laughs> at this moment, just because there is so much more uh, ideological retrenchment in the party. Um, and climate denial is one of those ideologies. Um, but I will welcome anybody really seeing that climate change needs to be acted on now. And I'll also say something that was influenced by just recently hearing Reverend William Barber of NAACP North Carolina and Moral Mondays. And he made this point very compellingly to me that, and to the whole audience, which is that just talking about all of the things we care about in the language of the left and the right is such limited language for the insane political moment we are living in right now. And he really made a, a compelling case for reclaiming moral language. So if we know that destroying the entire planet, which is really what we're talking about with climate change, leaving millions of people displaced in poverty uh, without access to the basic essentials to get their lives done, that's wrong. Right? It's a, it is a moral issue at the end of the day. And I think that is actually, that actually bridges across difference in a way that I think because climate change is also about science, sometimes people don't want to talk about it that way. But I, I would also offer that, that I think because the potential for solutions on climate change to really create a level of economic prosperity, to reduce the level of inequality that we see, um, that's, I think, something that a lot of people could get behind. And I think the proof is in the pudding of who is actually going to make those shifts. Yeah, and I, I do think that all the, the polling, at least, is pointing in a positive direction in terms of there being, you know, obviously there are, climate denialism is alive and well. It's deeply entrenched uh, in our politics. Um, but it, it, it seems like the needle is moving, um, you know, in the right direction. And there could be some common ground. And I think you're exactly right about the, it, framing this as a, you know, it is, it's a fundamentally a moral issue. Um, and obviously neither side has a monopoly on, um, on moral language. So anyway, this is incredibly uh, helpful, uh, May, and, and maybe we can check in with you a couple months down the line as this progresses a little more with some updates, but really want to thank you deeply for, for your time today, but really more so for your, your leadership. And I mean, you have been at this your entire adult life and the contribution you have made to this movement. Uh, there's few people that, that uh, compare. So keep up the good work and, uh, and thanks so much for sharing. Well, thank you, Chris. And I, I know that the indivisible chapters are full of people who are themselves lifelong activists and will become that. So that gives me enormous energy. So thanks for your work. And I hope I'll see a lot of you at the Climate March. You will. All right. Thanks. Bye.